Okay, everybody, welcome to the Sydney Science Trail. You, you guys having a good science week so far? Yeah? Oh, that was pretty depressing. All right, so we are talking today about scientific innovations. Okay, so we're really lucky. We have three leading scientists in their field today. They're here to talk about scientific innovations as part of the National Science Week. Okay, so before we begin, I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose land we're on today. Uh, and any elders, past, present and emerging who might be present here or any other members of the Indigenous community who are here today. So, this is part of National Science Week um, and the Sydney Science Trail is a combination between the Australian Museum uh, and the Botanic Gardens of Sydney, where we are today, in the beautiful Calyx. Um, and the National Science Week is part of a project by the Australian Government, University of Technology Sydney and University of New England. So we're lucky to have scientists from all three of those institutions here, um, and they're going to be talking to you about some of the really cool stuff that they're doing in their fields, all right? How they're innovating, how they're making new discoveries, and how they're um, finding out new things about our world and making the world a better place. All right, so first up, uh, we have Dr. Ikai T. He is a ichthyologist. Does anyone know what an ichthyologist is, by the way? It's a long word. It's like 16 letters. Yeah, it's fish. All right, so he studies fish. All right, he's known as Kai the fish guy, all right? He studies um, fish biodiversity in coral reefs. Okay, so he looks at all the diversity of fish in coral reefs. He's going to be talking to us today about how he uses submarines and how he does diving techniques um, to discover new species and also some of the work he does at the Australian Museum where he works um, to tell different species apart using DNA. So, Ikar, do you want to take it away? Hello. So many of you here today. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to reiterate what James has just said. I'm, a, I'm an ichthyologist, so I study fishes at the Australian Museum. Uh, specifically, I work on coral reef fishes, so all the really pretty stuff there that you see on the screen, those are really pretty fish that live on coral reefs. You probably know a little bit about them. They're all over the, you know, the media. You see them a lot in documentaries and stuff. Um, and I specifically work on a group of fishes called wrasses. So here are... Uh, here's a video of some flasher wrasses, um, and this is a particular group that I kind of specialize in. And when you think of coral reefs, you probably think of really shiny, bright coral gardens that are in shallow waters, um, things that you can experience uh, when you snorkel or when you dive. But I actually work on something called mesophotic coral reefs. Um, Colloquially, they're known as the twilight zone as well, and these are reefs that are between 50 to 250 meters. So they're much deeper than what you would normally think of as being traditional coral reefs. And to get down to those uh, mesophotic depths or the twilight zone, you can't use regular scuba diving equipment because it's way too deep for you. Um, so you have to use quite a bunch of scientific innovations um, to get down to that level. And mesophotic reefs are where majority of the new species of coral reef fishes are continuously being dis discovered and described. So here are just some species that I've named in the last five years alone, from 2016 to 2023. And you can see they look just like any other coral reef fishes. They're colorful, they're small, they're, they're gorgeous, but they live down below the deeper part of the reefs. Yeah? And here at the Australian Museum where I work, we have the fourth largest collection of type material of marine fishes anywhere in the world and the largest collection in the Southern Hemisphere. We have over 75,000 individual fish specimens housed at the museum. And these specimens have been collected from the 1800s all the way back in the 18th century. Uh, and we're still expanding the collections today with a whole bunch of different collection uh, te techniques and methods. So this collection obviously then represents a huge archive of specimens that we have uh, across historical time and space. And a lot of them are also preserved in a way that allows us to use um, modern techniques such as DNA analysis to tell species apart from each other. So we have an archival specimen collection of physical fishes and also uh, genetic libraries that we can then use to discriminate things that maybe you know, look kind of similar but have a more underlying complicated evolutionary histories that are underpin their diversity. And we also use a whole bunch of different expedition techniques. Um, so I was very fortunate enough to be on the Cocos Island and Christmas Island expedition that was carried out last year 
um, together with CSIRO Museums Victoria and uh, Western Australian Museum. And we use something called a open net trawl, which we release at the back of the boat and as the boat moves along, it collects fishes from anywhere between 200 to 600 meters um, down to even 6,000 meters, depending on what you want to collect. And these techniques help us to sample things that you would not otherwise be able to reach with um, scuba diving techniques. And if you remember before when I said mesophotic reefs are inaccessible through normal diving, so on the far right panel here is one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Louise Rocha from the California Academy of Sciences, and he's one of the foremost experts on mesophotic coral reef biology. So what he's wearing actually is not a scuba tank, but it's called a rebreather. So rebreathers are really special breathing apparatus that allow you to stay underwater for a, a long period of time because it basically scrubs the carbon dioxide out as you breathe. So if when you exhale underwater, instead of the air coming up as bubbles, it gets reabsorbed into the back of the rebreather and the carbon dioxide is filtered out, which allows you to breathe in the exhalant oxygen again for a second time. So you can actually stay down there for a lot longer than if you would with a regular scuba diving tank. Also, the mixture of air in a rebreather is mostly helium. So if you breathe atmospheric air right now, majority of the air that you're breathing in is nitrogen. And if you're down at 200 meters breathing in nitrogen, you get a condition called nitrogen narcosis, which puts you in a state of drunkenness almost. So you don't want that happening down at 200 meters. You want to be able to function with clarity of mind. And because helium is a lot lighter and a lot smaller molecularly than nitrogen, it prevents you from getting narcosis. So these are some of the cutting edge techniques that we use to go down to 200 meters to look at reefs that are otherwise inaccessible with just regular scuba diving. Um, we also use a bunch of very fancy um, ROVs uh, or manned submersibles as well, where we've actually modified some of the, um, well, I guess, mechanisms that allow us to use not only the submarine as a vehicle to get down to those reefs, but also to collect fishes. So I don't know if you can see from this photo, but there are two sets of blue tubing on the left and on the right, and they're actually DIY'd from um, just normal garden hose equipment that you can buy from Bunnings, but one of the arms actually dispenses a kind of anesthetic agent that puts the fish to sleep, and the other arm acts as a vacuum that sucks them up from the reef. So you get into the submarine, you go down to 300 meters, and you spray the reef with an anesthetic agent, and all the fish that get hit by the little cloud of gas that you're spraying, they, they fall asleep, and you suck them up with the hose. And then you bring everything up to the surface, and you look through your nets, and you figure out what's what, you sort them out, and then you, know, you start your process of trying to determine whether or not this fish is a new species or if it's a known species. So that's pretty much it. I, <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought I was going to go longer, but yeah, I feel was, like, you know, really cool, I, I, I feel like this now gives you a lot more time for questions if you yeah. have any. So I'm happy to take awesome. any, any questions that we you We might do have. all the questions at the end. Yeah, um, perfect. When everyone's on their page. Cool. Great. Thanks, you, Kai. No worries. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, Ekai makes fish drunk. Uh, all right. So, yeah, we're going to do a question and answer session at the end of this. So if you guys think of any really um, interesting questions you want to ask any of these guys, please feel free to hold in your mind and then we can ask them at the end. All right. So next up we have uh, Dr. Georgina Meekin. So Georgina is a um, senior lecturer in forensic science at the University of Technology in Sydney. So she's worked all over the world, in the UK, in the US, and here in Australia, solving case crimes using forensic DNA, okay? So she's even actually been on a, on a BBC documentary about a real life case as a forensic DNA scientist. So she's gonna be talking to us today a bit about environmental DNA and how it could be used uh, to solve crime cases. So, uh, George, anyone take it away? Try not to fall off the chair. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, as James has said, I'm Georgina Meekin. I'm a senior lecturer in forensic science at UTS. And today I'm gonna to talk about environmental DNA, but I'm also gonna just talk in general, in general about how we use DNA within forensic science. Now let's start from the beginning first before I get into how all these fun, innovative stuff that we can do with DNA. But we want to start, as a forensic scientist, at the crime scene or examining an item within the laboratory, 
what are we trying to answer? What are we trying to figure out? Well, the first question is who was involved? And when I say that, I don't just mean can we identify a potential person of interest who might have you know, committed the crime, but also thinking about who the victim was, if it's not obvious from the outset, or perhaps even identifying a witness who might be able to come forward and tell us what they saw. So we want to identify people. But more than that, we also want to think about what happened. Firstly, was it even a crime? Do we even need to investigate this as a crime? Second, what are the order of events that happened that actually resulted in this criminal activity? When did it happen? And where did it happen? Because that's not always obvious, and sometimes you might end up with a secondary crime scene. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So one of the most obvious ways, obviously thinking about who, thinking about who might have been involved, is to analyze for human DNA. You know, all living organisms have DNA, and we can detect that DNA, and we've got some really great sensitive and specific technologies now that we can detect very, very small amounts of DNA, right down to just a handful of cells. And if you think about you know, the size of a pinhead, that's 10,000 cells, and we only need something like five or six to get a DNA profile. So we need a very, very small amount of material completely invisible to the eye. So we get a lot of DNA. Um, so we can detect human DNA specifically, or to a point, because let's be honest, we're not actually genetically dissimilar enough from higher primates. So everything, all the analysis we do for human DNA could actually also be done on higher primates. Um, but obviously, most uh, crime scenarios that we uh, deal with, we're going to be fairly confident we're getting human DNA when we detect it. But we can also analyze for other kinds of DNA. That could be DNA coming from bacteria, from plants, from fungi. And when we analyze that DNA from samples such as soil or water or even the air, that's referred to as environmental DNA analysis. And that can give us some information that can help with the what happened. We can start linking uh, items that we find for, on a suspect, such as their clothing and the traces, such as soil traces on their clothing, to a crime scene, for example. Or we can start trying to time when things happen, and I'll give you some examples. So thinking about that environmental DNA, as I say, we're going to be analysing um, so essentially a DNA profile from their environmental sample, for example, soil. And that DNA profile is going to consist of DNA from microbes, from fungi, from various different plant matter that you find within soil. And we can use that along with chemical analysis of the soil and also just visual examination of the soil down to colour, particle size and that kind of thing to try and see if we can match the soil sample that we have from, for example, a suspect to the soil sample from the crime scene. So let's take, for example, a residential burglary. Someone may have walked through the back garden to gain access to the property via the back door. And if it's rained recently, that the soil of that garden might be um, quite damp. They might walk through and leave footwear marks. So one form of analysis we can do once a suspect is identified is to compare their footwear to those footwear marks. But that's assuming you get a mark of good enough quality that you can actually see all that intricate soil detail. But if you can't see that, well, then we need to turn to the soil and look at the soil from the garden and look at the soil from the footwear and use environmental DNA and other chemical analysis to see if the soil could be from the same source. Similarly, if your body has been dumped out in the countryside, that's a secondary crime scene, you can then analyse the soil from around that body, and once you've identified a suspect, you might look for soil, for example, in the boot of their car where they maybe transported the body, or from a spade that might have been used to dig a shallow grave. So these are all very valuable information about the what happened that we can find out by using uh, environmental DNA in soil. So to give you some more examples, we can also examine the, the DNA in water. And again, looking at microbe, looking at algae, those kinds of things that you find in water, we can look at the DNA and analyse the DNA. And this can again help us with the what happened and possibly with the when. So let's say a body washes up on the side of a stream or a flowing river. We perform an autopsy on that body. We find water in the lungs that confirms that that individual drowned. So where did they drown and when did they drown? Well, we can examine the environmental DNA in the water of the lung and be able to then sample the river at various points and be able to identify the point at which the body um, went into the water and, and drowned. We can also examine the microbial DNA within the gut 
within the brain, within the liver, and provide information about how long the body was submerged within the water. Again, giving information about the when and possibly the where, depending on how the distance that that um, body has traveled in the water. So as you might be starting to realize, we have DNA everywhere. We do not live in a clean environment. So even when you have a crime scene in you know, a normal everyday environment, so here's an example of a kitchen with a um, mock murder scene. This is a kitchen within our crime scene suite at UTS. And you see a couple of our students are examining the scene. So again, we can think about trying to examine and recover human DNA. We might examine the body itself, like recover DNA from underneath the fingernails from a potential perpetrator. Or we could examine, for example, the surfaces, the countertops within the kitchen to try and identify who might have been in the kitchen, who might have been there at the time this happened. We could look for human DNA from people who might have been present, but we can also look for microbial DNA. Now, we as humans, we are covered in bacteria. We have bacteria in various different parts of our body and different um, populations of bacterial species depending on where they are in our body because it's different environments. So for example, on our hands, we have bacterial DNA. We, so when we touch something, not only do we leave our own DNA, we also leave DNA from other people who you know, you've been sitting next to or touching in some way. You pick up their DNA. We carry maybe 10 to 15% of the DNA on our hands is coming from someone else. And, but we also deposit microbial DNA. So if we do an analysis, say we take a swab from the top of that counter, we may, not, we may get human DNA, but if that's unsuccessful, we may then examine for microbial DNA, and we can use that as, to create a distinctive profile that can be matched to an individual. And then just in the last couple of years, we've seen research expanding to, to literally sample the air. So researchers in Oslo have shown using this little device that looks a bit like an air purifier. They hang it up on the wall. The air filters um, through a filter. The DNA binds to the filter. The filter can then be taken and examined, and human DNA can be recovered. So they've demonstrated in a meeting room, in an office, in a lab, that people, um, their DNA can be detected if they've been working in those spaces. So again, we might extend this out to other kinds of crime scenes. And again, these are photos of our crime scene suite at UTS. We see, like, if there's been a burglary in a jewelry store or in a cafe, can we recover DNA from the air from the individual committing that crime? Now, this is really, really early research. So there's still loads of questions that we haven't answered yet with the research. For example, how long do you need to be in a room to leave your DNA in the air? Does, do you need to be doing particular activities? Or if you were just, say, sleeping in the room, could you um, gain the DNA from the air? Or if you're actually you know, committing a burglary, you're going to be in and out in just a few minutes. Is that enough time to leave your DNA? So these are all questions that are still ongoing and research is still happening. Um, but hopefully, during this time, I've given you some insight of the cool things that we can do with DNA in forensic science and how it can help us to gain information about the who did it and the when and where and how did it happen. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Georgina. All right, very cool stuff, okay. All right, so we've had two very different talks and we're going to go on to a third really interesting area, which is paleoscience. So we have uh, Amber Whitebone here. She is a PhD candidate at the University of New England and she is looking at uh, basically how the dinosaurs moved and how they used to behave. So she's going to tell us about a special uh, microscope that she's using to investigate dinosaur bones, to figure out how they're moving and behaving a uh, long way back in the past. Thanks, Amber. Cool. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so we are going to be talking a little bit today about how the smallest pieces of a dinosaur bone can tell us about how these large creatures moved around, behaved, and interacted with each other. But before we get into that, uh, in addition to acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora here, which are the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today, I also want to acknowledge that the fossils that we're going to be seeing in my presentation today are from the Treaty 7 region of Alberta, Canada, where I'm from which is the traditional territory of the Nitsitapi, Tsutina, and Eahe Nakoda. So I'm very grateful for all of the knowledge keepers and elders past, present, and emerging. So who here in the room has seen a movie, television show, video game with a dinosaur in it? 
Yeah, pretty much everyone in the room, I know my favorite growing up was the classic Jurassic World or Jurassic Park now Jurassic World and all of those. Way back a million years ago, we had this original The Lost World that you can see there. Um, so at the time, that's what we thought a T-Rex looked like. And our understanding of what it looked like has changed a little bit, um, as we can see in all of these good or not so good films <laughs> uh, in the past couple years. Uh, but how do we go from looking at a skeleton of one of these prehistoric creatures. So for example, this is a full skeleton of a baby uh, triceratops dinosaur. How do we go from the skeleton to an animation of what that creature looked like and how it moved around? Or what if we only have a couple of bones, like this is a study I did a couple years ago where that jawbone is probably about the length of your thumb and we had a claw and just a couple other bones. So how do we go from just a few things to what we think that dinosaur looked like. Or to take it a step further, how do we look at something where we only have a couple of bones, like from this study, and determine what that dinosaur ancient creature looked like and how it behaved. You can see the researchers from this study thought that that animal was possibly diving and swimming and catching fish underwater. So how do we find those things out? Well, the first step that lots of paleontologists do is we compare things to their most closely related living uh, correlates. So for dinosaurs, you often hear them being compared to birds and crocodiles because those are the two most closely related living things to all dinosaurs. But on top of that, we can also look at their bones specifically. So this here is a duck-billed dinosaur. This is Edmontosaurus regalis from Alberta, where I'm from. And let's look at just its humerus. So that's the, the bone that our bicep is attached to. Uh, so if we look at just this bone, we can look for bumps and ridges on the bone surface that tells us that a muscle was attaching there. So for example, the more you use a muscle, the more it pulls on the bone, which means that more bone is gonna grow in that area. So if anyone here were to do 10 arm wrestles uh, every day of their life for the next 50 years, one of your arm bones would be way bigger than the one on the other side, for example. But if there are no bumps and ridges on the surface of the bone, sometimes we have to look inside it, and that's what I do. So, although it may be shocking, what I do is I cut the bones up to see what's inside. Uh, so I take these uh, fossils, I cut them up into slices that are about the thickness of uh, tissue you would blow your nose with, and I look at them under a microscope. And so this is what one of those slides would look like, just using normal light, no filters or anything. So you can see there's some areas of the bone that are a little bit bubbly, so there's more air in the bone in those areas. And then the darker areas, that's where the bone was really dense, meaning that it needed to withstand any pressures or anything like that. We can also use a couple of filters to kind of emphasize that. So you can see the, the filter in the center there is showing us um, more clearly where the bubbly areas of the bone are, whereas this pink filter is showing us all of the areas that might be a little bit more dense. But what I'm doing is applying a brand new type of filter for fossils, uh, which I like to call the rainbow filter. The technical name for it is liquid crystal cross-polarized light microscopy, but that's such a mouthful that I just call it a rainbow filter. And it looks a little bit like this. It's gorgeous to look at, which is amazing. And what it is showing is that the color directly corresponds to what direction the bone fibers have arranged themselves. So for example, all of those fibers in blue have arranged themselves to point in the direction that that muscle was pulling. So if we compare that, to the overall structure of the bone, we can tell what direction a muscle was pulling in. So as opposed to before, where we might just think, oh, there's this bump on the bone, therefore the muscle's pulling this direction, we can get some more uh, refined information to show us that maybe that muscle was pulling upwards instead of outwards. So if we look at the behavior of the animal, that might tell us, okay, maybe this duck-billed dinosaur wasn't using its muscles mostly to swing its forearm forward, but maybe it was pulling its arm up. So behaviorally, maybe instead of walking through shallow water where it really has to push its feet forward, instead it was walking through mud and had to pull its little hands out of the mud all of the time, for example. So that's how we can go from just the bones 
to all of these beautiful reconstructions of behavior and um, like the T-Rex swimming underwater here or these giant sauropod dinosaurs rearing up and fighting with each other. That's how we can kind of interpret all of that from just a couple of bones that we might be lucky enough to find. All right, thank you so much. Looking forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Amber, that was great. Uh, I, I have to ask, how real is Jurassic Park? Is it, is it real or is it fake? There are some glaring inaccuracies. The newer Jurassic Parks are, and Jurassic Worlds are much more accurate oh, that's than good to know. the early ones. Yeah. All right, very good. Okay, so now you guys have a chance to ask any questions you want of these guys. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Ooh. Some pretty cool discussions. And we have a special National Science Week hat for whoever asks the best question. Ah. That's a pretty good hat, if I do say so myself. So go ahead. Anyone want to ask anything? No one wants to ask anything? You sure? <laughs> All right, well, I'll ask something. No, no. Oh, we got, we got one. Yes. yes. What's your question? Oh, great question. Ooh. Great question. <laughs> You're stressing these scientists out now. So the question was, how do you secure funding for all of your research? Yeah. Who wants to go first? Oh, um, uh, a lot of it is just applying to any and every opportunity that you can find, um, either uh, lo like locally. So I, w I applied to a lot of funding opportunities in Canada and then also applied to a few here in Australia. But a lot of it is just a lot of Googling and applying for literally anything you can find. Yeah, what okay. did you say? I'm just gonna reiterate what, um, so I'm just gonna repeat what Amber said. Yeah. The more you apply for, the higher chances of winning something is. Mm -hmm. So just don't be afraid to put your hat out there in the ring and just apply for everything. And there's also obviously grants that are very specific to your particular research. Like, you know, for example, like I would never be eligible for any of the paleontology research grants that maybe Amber's eligible for. So knowing what you are eligible for and what you can apply for is also really important. So you don't waste your time just kind of putting stuff out there. And I will give a different answer. Uh, forensic science, notoriously difficult to fund research in, ironically, given you think that it would have, a, you know, it has such a big importance within the society, but it's really hard to find any of this traditional funding that these guys are talking about. It's pretty much impossible within forensic science. Not, not entirely impossible, and Australia, I think, is a little bit better at it, hence me being here, because clearly you may have gathered from my accent that I'm not Australian. Um, but we actually do quite well with industry funding, so I do quite a lot of work with the police and with um, casework forensic science laboratories, and they very kindly provide in-kind funding, so that's one way. Uh, I also do consultancy and casework, which I then feed straight back into funding my own research as well. Great, thanks guys. All right, does anyone else have a question? Yes, down the front here. Oh, great question. That's one I want to know. So how can you tell if a dinosaur had scales or if it had feathers? Amber, this one's for you. This is an excellent question. Um, so a lot of that is comparing it to its most closely related living thing, but there are certain situations with uh, flight feathers, for example, um, they're anchored right into the bone. So we found with flight feathers specifically, we can find little, almost like holes in the bone where they're like attached right in there, which is pretty cool because they control their feathers with muscles, so that's something I can look into too. But um, a lot of it is um, comparing to the modern, and then there are certain exceptional situations where we have the soft tissues preserved themselves. Uh, for example, there's one really amazing fossil. I think it's on tour now. It's usually housed in the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Alberta. Um, you might have heard of it, uh, Boreala Pelta Mark Mitchelli or uh, the Suncor Notosaur, they call it, because it was found in uh, an oil uh, site. I don't, yeah, anyways, but it has its skin preserved. You can see the face of this dinosaur. Uh, one of its feet is tipped up the wrong way, and you can see all the scales that are preserved on the pad of its foot. So really exceptional preservation or um, constrained speculation, I'll say. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, yeah, great question, great question. Work in progress. All right, who else has a question? Yes, over here. Um, what is the most amazing, fascinating part of the research? Oh, great. Okay, this is for all three of our scientists. So the question was, what is the most unique and fascinating part of your field of study? Ooh. You go first. Me? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I forgot to explain before in my talk that I'm a taxonomist and what a taxonomist does is that we basically classify all living things and in doing so we discover new species sometimes. And I think getting to not only discover a new species but giving it a name and deciding which family or which genus it belongs to, putting them into a little category and finding a lot more about not just their current, um, the way they live, their, their extent biology, but how they relate to species that have been extinct or species that live across the world. Mm -hmm. Looking into the evolutionary relationships of a new species and putting a name to it is very rewarding, I think, for me. And it's just something that I, I, I never forget as a scientist working in that particular field. So well, that's, my, that's my answer for that question. So that's a very cool answer. I don't think I can top this in any shape or form. Um, so I mentioned during my talk this idea that you carry other people's DNA on your hands. Now what that means is when you touch something, you can leave their DNA on it. When you go to a place, you can leave their DNA in that place, place even though they will never have been to that place or touched that item. So this means that when we're uh, analysing items from a crime scene, when we recover DNA from that item, we don't necessarily know that DNA has come from someone who even touched that item or was ever there. So that adds a whole extra layer of interpretation that when we find DNA, we've got to figure out, like, what's the likelihood of it actually coming from a particular person and what's the likelihood of it coming, uh, having been deposited in a particular action, like, for example, the committing of a crime, as opposed to just having got there innocently through this idea of indirect DNA transfer. Really neat. Yeah, I would say I'm going to build on what Dr. Kai here said um, about... Um, comparing the like evolutionary trends of um, past things to present things. So um, increasingly in paleontology nowadays is we're using what we know of all of these ancient prehistoric creatures and how they behaved and adapted to dramatic changes in their climate, uh, you know, mass extinctions and that sort of thing. And using information from that to predict and um, evaluate how all the species that are alive today are going to respond to the climate change that we're experiencing and how we can best uh, target our efforts to conserve uh, what we have on this beautiful planet. So, yeah, I'd say that's what I find most oh, interesting. Great. Thanks, guys. Great answers. Oh, very exciting. Anyone else have any, any questions for our scientists today? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes, this one's for Amber. Yes. What do you use to cut the bones open? It's not a saw, is it? No, it is a saw, it is a saw. actually. <laughs> not a uh, saw like the little figure in, um, uh, that I showed, but it's a series of different things. Um, but the first tool is a diamond-edged uh, table saw, so just like one of the big wheels, but it has a diamond dust, I guess, embedded into the edge because that's harder than any of the fossils that we'll be cutting up with it. So I can cut a nice clean line through it, and then I use a whole bunch of series of other saws and grinding tools to get it down to really, really, really thin. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a long process. It takes cool. weeks. All right. Yeah. Yes, down the front here. Yeah, really good question. Yeah, so that question was to all of our scientists. When did you know what branch of science you wanted to get involved with and, and pursue study in? For me, I've always I've always loved fishes when I was when I was a kid. I spent a lot of my time actually before uni working at in fish stores. So I've always had that natural connection and passion towards fishes. But it was only kind of when I did undergrad in university that I realized that I wanted to be a biologist. And so I then connected that, you know, why not just become a fish scientist and, and fill that gap in the literature? And I think that's a really good thing about universities is that you spend the first one or two years as a uni student learning a little bit about everything. And then at the end of that experience, you kind of walk away with a better understanding of what you like. And then you kind of just, you know, hone in on that particular interest and find a little niche in there that you could feel. Um, and yeah, it's great if you can even link your passion to it, then you know you, you never have to work a day in your life because you just do something that you love. I would say I still don't know, I think. Yeah, I, th um, I mean, I love dinosaurs and prehistoric things, but I've done many things. I started off doing theater and then came back and did science. And 
Uh, I kind of just follow what excites me at the time. So I used to study uh, fossil fish, and then I studied fossil amphibians for a bit, and now I study dinosaurs, and who knows what I'll be studying in 10 years. But I, uh, you know, um, all learning is uh, applicable in some way. So yeah, I would say just do what excites you. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a fair point, because like, for me, I always wanted to be in forensic science. Even as a teenager, I watched a lot of those, you know, classic CSI shows and that kind of thing and got really inspired by the idea of doing science that meant something and could help society. And I really wanted to be able to do that. And then for me, I went on and did a molecular biology degree as my first degree. So I was always really interested in DNA and I did some stuff in cancer genetics and various other uses of DNA. But ultimately, I've always ended up coming back to forensic science. I just really like yeah, being able to do something that I feel has an impact on society. Great. Thanks, guys. Really good. Yeah. Uh, yes, down here. Oh, who's? Oh, who's oh, okay, yes, yes. All right. We'll come back to you. Yes. Sure? Okay, we can come back to you if you want to go in. Yes. Oh, great question. What liquid is in the jars you preserve the fish in? So fishes are stored in ethanol, alcohol, basically. But um, we have a two-step preservation process. So they are fixed in formalin first. So formalin is a weaker form of formaldehyde, which is a fixing agent. We need the formaldehyde to really get into the tissue so that it doesn't disintegrate. And once the formaldehyde has kind of set in, we transfer the specimens permanently into alcohol. So yeah, they're stored in alcohol, but they are fixed in formalin first. The problem with fixing things in formaldehyde is that it destroys and it degrades DNA. So if we want to preserve um, genetic material from the specimen that we're preserving, what we normally do is we remove a little chunk of tissue first, we call that subsampling. And that tissue sample then goes straight into alcohol or some other sort of um, you know, tissue safe fixing agent while the rest of the specimen gets fixed in formalin and then transferred to ethanol. Great, okay. Uh, I've been neglecting this side of the room. So yes, out of the back here. Okay. Uh, Has the submarine ever failed or have you ever had any submarine problems? Fortunately for me, no. It's actually not super common to use a manned submersible for research. A lot of times we use what's called an ROV, which is a remote operated vehicle. So we put a submarine down that is tethered to the main ship and there's a pilot on the ship that drives the submarine around and we can then control what the submarine does from the ship. So a lot of our expeditions actually rely on ROVs. The problem with ROVs is that they're not, they're not as finessed as going down manually into those reefs because imagine trying to catch a fish no longer than the size of your thumb with a five ton submarine that has blaring lights and you know, it makes a ton of noise and generates a lot of heat. Like you are just not able to catch tiny little fish. So there are pros and cons to using submarines. A lot of times we just put them down there to get a better understanding of what lives there. And we know, oh, there are tons of new species down there, but then, you know, we just can't get to them. So hope that answers your question. Great. Okay. So no, no submarine issues. Yes, down here. So if the body doesn't have a... Oh, like if you, if you can't, if you don't have an ID on the body? Oh, yes. So the question was, I think, for Georgina. If the body doesn't have an ID, how do you, how you identify who that person might be? OK, there's se several ways we can do that. We can do that through fingerprinting. Um, and that can be of a living or a deceased individual. Um, in terms of then seeing if we happen to have their fingerprints on a database, that's one option. Uh, another option is, is taking their DNA. And again, it's dependent on whether their DNA is on the database or not. Uh, another option is through dental records. Um, and so there are a variety of, of sort of biological ways in which we can try and identify someone. Um, if all of that turns up nothing and we still can't identify them, we now have some newer techniques that we can do where we can predict someone's physical characteristics from their DNA. So we can predict someone's hair colour, someone's eye colour, um, to a certain degree, the facial shape, uh, and then also ethnicity, also an element of their height. So you can start to put together an image of what someone might look like from their DNA, get that image out into the public, and that's another way of trying to get some intelligence leads um, to identify the individual. Great, okay. We probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes, stand here. 
Oh, great question. So when you were in high school, what were your grades in science like? I was terrible in high school. I, I kind of bloomed a little bit later than, than I hoped. I didn't do very well in high school. Um, I somehow managed to get into uni. Um, and then I just decided that I really loved science and I just kind of worked really hard from there. So don't, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're all really, really bright kids, but if you don't do well in a particular subject, don't be discouraged because there's a lot of non-traditional, non-linear paths that you can take to reach your end point. And it's not necessarily all about just straight A's. That's what I have to say. I would absolutely agree. I had very middle of the road grades in high school. Um, I thought there were more important things in life than studying at the time, which I'm, you know, stay in school, you know, do, do your schooling. But yeah, absolutely. Grades aren't everything. I did so poorly in my first year of university. I was actually booted from the university and luckily they gave me a second chance. So, um, and now here I am getting all these great opportunities to study whatever I want, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, if you don't have straight A's, don't, I, I would say don't panic. It's not the end of the world, but yeah, it's okay. See, I don't really want to comment now because I got straight A's, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. All right, last question. We're going to go over here, yeah. Oh. oh. How do you know the colour of the dinosaurs? That's a great question, yes. So, um, some of it is, uh, again, comparing to modern things. So, for example, we often see dinosaurs uh, depicted as being uh, darker coloured on top and lighter coloured underneath because in the... You know, terrestrial biological world, um, so things that live on land, that's often uh, the patterning that we see because anything trying to eat something from the sky, uh, if anything's brightly colored on top, they'll be easily able to pick it out. Uh, so often things evolve to be darker colored on the top um, so that predators from above can't find them. Uh, that's called counter shading. But other than that, sometimes when we have skin preserved, there are a special type of cell uh, that can be preserved in there. And if we can find those, the shape of that cell gives us um, a range of what color that particular tissue was. That's a really good question. Fancy new science, that's I feel, what that is. I feel yeah. like we could talk about dinosaurs and, and all this stuff for the whole day. But unfortunately, we're gonna to have to conclude. So can I get a round of applause for our great scientists, please? <laughs> awesome stuff. And thank you guys for asking some really great questions. Um, honestly, it was very hard to choose the best question, but I wanted to choose the question about most interesting thing in your field. So congrats, you win the, you win the special hat. I'll come and give it to you afterwards. So let's get a round of applause for that question. Oh, I thought everyone gets a hat. <laughs> and that concludes the session. Hope you have a good rest of your science week uh, and keep studying science because it's very fun, it's very interesting. Thanks, guys. So yeah.